All right, Chris Vanini is with us. He is a college football writer for The Athletic. He also does a podcast on the side, which is why he's here with us, called Getting Over, which is a wrestling podcast, which makes him a very intriguing person to me, covering sports at a national level and has a side interest in wrestling there. Chris, welcome. Hey, happy to be here. So the, the first question is, to me, I, I find it fascinating that you are doing, you're a national journalist for a giant publication and a wrestling person because, and, and I'll tell you why I, I'm fascinated, which is back in the day, back in the day when I was working for uh, KMBR 680 in out here in the Bay Area, uh, I did not necessarily make it that easy to for people to know that i was also a wrestling fan but that was 25 years ago or whatever right so like do you or is, is there still any issues with that like do people kind of give you stuff for for uh being a wrestling fan no you know i, I was a wrestling fan before i was a sports fan i mean i write about college football now but you know when i was growing up i just remember walking in one day it was one of the in your house pay-per-views in 97 undertaker versus Shawn Michaels and just uh -huh. being like, well, what is this? And my dad happened to be watching it. And, and I just kind of got into it there. And at that point, the only sports I cared about were the Detroit Red Wings growing up in Detroit, but I didn't really watch ESPN or do any of that other stuff. So I, for, from 97 to Oh one to the invasion, I was a wrestling guy. Like that was my thing. Right. And then when I got into middle school, made some new friends who liked other sports. I kind of got into ESPN and football and all those other things and stayed out of wrestling for like 10 years or so. And then got back in around uh, CM Punk versus rock mm -hmm. uh, raw, one, raw 1000, that Royal rumble. And ever since then I've been kind of all in on it uh, again. It just was kind of a decade away, came back and it's really grown into such a huge thing where I write for the athletic. I write about college football, but I can write about wrestling in different ways. I did a story about Roman Reigns when he played at Georgia tech. I did a story about Bray Wyatt when he played at Troy and in, in junior college, uh, how do college football players become pro wrestlers? And now right as WWE is making that push to get college athletes to be wrestlers, it's really turned into a great, uh, thing that mixes together and there'll be football coaches who like wrestling they'll text me something about it like you know like <laughs> they're, they're, as you as you kind of alluded to it was kind of an not underground but like something people didn't express publicly for so long but it's very much part of the mainstream now no and it's great to hear that uh that that there is because back in the day college football was a giant pipeline for pro wrestling like you look at uh you know back in the, in the a lot of the guys who became stars in, in like the 80s like they had all gone to i think it was at west texas state or whatever and and yeah, played football yeah. and that kind of became a pipeline for uh for, for wrestling there so obviously we're gonna bounce you know back and forth between college football and, and wrestling because i just think it, it's so fascinating but i'm also kind of interested in what uh the idea of, of media is today. And so uh, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a background. Um, the idea that you can be a, a surefire national journalist and also give your opinions on, on wrestling on the side. Uh, I, I was, I was, uh, I, I subscribed to a website called puck and puck is a journalism, heavy website. They cover entertainment business, Hollywood politics, and they got covered by the New Yorker. And in the New Yorker piece, the idea behind the piece was journalists are now influencers or journalists are now content creators. And there's like this weird gray area between journalism and going on YouTube and creating a page and going like, here's my take on X. Like with this kind of the way that media works today, like how do you kind of juggle or how do you define what you do? And, and do you do you consider it like part of like this new media? Are you a little bit more old school in your journalism? Like, where do you where do you stand there? So back in 2009, I got onto this new thing called Twitter. 
And a lot of, I was cover. I was a student at Michigan state covering the football team. And a lot of the older writers on the beat thought this whole thing was ridiculous. Make jokes about Twitter, tweet, 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 whatever. And so I was one of the earlier people in kind of sports media who, who really got into it at the time. I created the account for our student newspaper at the time and, and, and did that. And that has really led me to almost every job I have was Twitter because I was able to promote myself. I was able to share opinions, news, whatever on an account that other people noticed. I worked for a site called coachingsearch.com for five years that if not for Twitter, people would not probably know what it is. That's what got it to the masses. So I've understood ever since I came out of college that you have to be able to sell yourself and sell your work and not solely rely upon your outlet to do that work for you, which is why the concerns about Twitter going away, I think are very bad for people in the media. It gives us, it gives us identity. It gives us the dopamine hits of a retweet. It gives you sure. leverage. If you have a hundred thousand followers that can help you get another job that can help you in your contract negotiation. If, if you're at your current place. So it gives people in the media some status a, a, a bit and whether it's Twitter, whether it's another social media platform now that everybody's on uh, these things matter, especially for people in the media where, yeah, we are content creators. I'm not paid to tweet my thoughts on whatever different thing I'm paid for my work that I write for the athletic. Sure. But it helps to be able to have that. Now, as a part of what you do for the athletic is social a part of it. Like when, when the athletic brings you on, do they say, we also want you to be good at social because it helps you get the reads. Now, the reason why I say that is the baseball winter meetings are going on and, John Heyman yesterday tweeted that the Giants were close to getting Aaron Judge, and then he immediately pulled back and said, whoops, I got bad information. But that is still out there today because Aaron Judge signed with the New York Yankees. So I, I would imagine the idea of using social in that way is, is pretty scary. Now, I don't know if that is – it doesn't seem like that's really your forte to kind of just break news on Twitter like it is for some of – some like Adam Schefter or – Adrian Wojnarowski, but is that also a, a, a part of what you bring to the table for, for what you do as a journalist? When I joined the athletic, I ran the college football Twitter account for the first two years. I want to say, because we were a staff of 50, 60 people. Our college football staff was seven people. So there was nobody else to kind of run that. And because that was <laughs> something I had done for so long, I was more than happy to do it. But it's not like in my contract or something that right. I, I have to do it. It's it's a lot of us journalists are very insecure people with fragile egos. And so we need the uh, gratification of people seeing our stuff on social media so that that's part of it. And there is a news aspect to that. I mean, if you think about it, how much news does Adam Schefter break on Twitter and not ESPN? Yeah, it's always on Twitter. So yeah. like if Twitter went away, what does that do to Adam Schefter's value? I think it completely changes it. And, and right. it also Adam Schefter is on every TV show they have. So he, he does those kinds of things, but how would that change the value of him to the company? These are the kinds of things that social media does. These are the things that individual reporters are able to do that are not necessarily in the scope of their job or what's written into their contract. Uh, absolutely. All right. Well, well, let's talk some pro wrestling. We'll, we'll go back. I have another, I have a couple other questions, especially around college football. But you meant you kind of gave your your uh, story uh, uh, of becoming a wrestling fan and getting back into it. Now, you and your your uh, your podcast partner, Adam Silverstein, uh, you guys have a podcast called Getting Over and you co you cover, you know, the bigs, WWE, AEW. Where do you sit on where wrestling is today? Uh, uh, do you lean a little bit more towards WWE? Do you like what AEW is doing? Like, what is your focus when, when you're sitting at, cause watching wrestling is watching a lot of content these days. Yeah. You know, I, I typically, it, it, well, it depends in football season is tough because I'm so busy. I'm watching raw. I'm watching SmackDown because I have to do the podcast. I try to catch AEW as much as I can in the off season. I'm, I'm watching them both every week. When, you know, kind of just when I have 
more time. And it, it's it's been interesting. You know, Adam does the the AEW NXT shows on his own on Thursdays. I do the WWE recap shows on Mondays where we talk SmackDown and, and Raw. And we started the show, or he started the show in early 2020. And uh, I came aboard a couple episodes in and that happened to be right when the pandemic hit, you know, so it was almost the worst possible time to, to start something like that. And so I, I do it once a week. He does it twice. I'm always watching raw. I'm typically not watching SmackDown live because it's Friday night and I'm either working or doing something and I'll catch it on Thursday on the review or something like that. But it's, it really is between the, the four shows, Dynamite, Rampage, Raw, SmackDown, they are, Four completely different shows. Yeah. Honestly, it, it feels like Raw and SmackDown are very different. The three hours versus two hours is, is different. Rampage is not very much different than Dark these days. So it uh, it's definitely a mix of things. Interesting. So uh, where wrestling is today, where really the TV money dr drives the industry uh, and AEW is kind of, you know, immediate rise and then a little bit of a plateau that we're seeing right now uh do you think that uh aew can ever i i don't want to say get to where wwe is because wwe is at a place that is kind of ridiculous if you look back 10 years uh to see where they are but do you think that we will have this sort of competition the, these these two companies on national tv or do you think the the industry only can only will it really survive with, with WWE. No, I, I think both will continue to be around and they need to both be around. You need options. You need competition. It's better for everybody. It's better for wrestlers money. It's better for stories. It's better for everything. I mean, AEW, they come to, I live here in Dallas. They come over to Garland a couple times a year. I think I've been to almost every show they've done here. They'll be here in a, next week. I think uh, for, for winter is coming. Um, and it's, it's a completely different show going to that than it is going to, WWE show in downtown Dallas. And, and that's good. It, it, it's good to have those different things. You know, the, the, the Turner Warner brothers, whatever they're calling themselves now, they seem to understand the value of live wrestling. And, and I, I know, and obviously, you know, Dave points out all the time, you can't just compare viewership now to viewership at a different time. Right. right. There's fewer viewers. It, it, it's where you rank on what you are. And in AW still remains one of the most watched things on cable in his time slot on Wednesdays. And that's good. That That's really good. And, and, and Raw and SmackDown continue to as well. The more companies, the more broadcasters that are into wrestling, that's good for everybody. It helps AEW that WWE has fought so hard to become mainstream to not just be the old wrestling type of thing. You know, the PG era, call it whatever. The 20 years or so that WWE has been working to become mainstream cultural, uh, uh, acceptable, mainstream culture acceptable uh trickles down to everybody and i think that's helped AEW as well and that's good and i think they understand they all work together tony khan's got a lot of money so i don't think they're yeah. going away <laughs> they're going away anytime soon and it seems pretty clear that turner likes having them on one of the stories that you did uh i think it's been a couple months now was on the nfl and college football historically not competing against each other on television and that there was this sort of contract that they would not. And now it seems like that's going to change. I know the NFL is going to do a Black Friday game next year. Uh, so you're you're pretty you're pretty clued in to, to, to the TV stuff. Where do you see what, what do you think is going to happen with this AEW television negotiation here, uh, especially with, you know, Warner Brothers Discovery kind of pulling back on, on everything else? Yeah, I, obviously. Warner Brothers is cutting a lot, HBO, HLN, different channels that are kind of all under this big umbrella. It happens when you make mergers and it sucks for a lot of people involved. But from my understanding, it's not like Turner's paying for the, the travel for AEW to go to different shows. That's still AEW doing that. So if, if Turner's basically just providing a time slot, then everything should be fine. I mean, like, like, like we said, we know they're one of the most watched things on that network on TNT or TBS, whichever one it, it happens to be. And it's live, like live sports continue to be the most important thing on television. It's probably the only thing holding television up still together. Yeah. I mean, you, you look at the top 100 
most viewed TV shows of 2021 and like 80 of them are NFL games. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like 10 of them are college games. The Olympics are in their college basketball, like football, especially, but live sports are incredibly valuable. And it's the only thing that keeps people coming back to live TV. So live wrestling provides that. It, it, that's why the WWE deal jumped so much previously and may jump again with the next deal because it is one of the most viewed things that they have. If you have a live sports property right now, that is still going up and up and up, even as viewership TV homes go down. At some point, that's going to pop. But, you know, these, these TV companies are trying to survive and live sports are doing that. Where do you stand uh, with uh, how Triple H has done w when it comes to taking over creative? There's one side who's like super jazzed that Triple H has brought a lot of people back. And there's another side. And I probably sit a little closer on this side, which is like, eh, he's he's doing a babyface version of, of Vince um, where a, it's a lot of similar stuff, but he's not doing a lot of the negative things that, that Vince would do. Where do you, like, how would you grade Triple H so far since he took over creative? Look, the floor for him to make improvements was pretty low. <laughs> doing doing things like saying wrestling, like like pointing out other companies existing so many of those restrictions that vince had simply taking those away just made everything feel a lot fresher yeah i Michael call it Cole, the uh i call it the uh the, the control uh what is it control z uh, uh on the keyboard Let, let's just yeah, go yeah. back let's just reverse yeah. that thing yeah michael cole has been a lot more enjoyable on commentary and i think probably because he doesn't have vince screaming in his ear all the time so it, it the floor has gotten better none of it feels terrible like we we do a segment on the podcast we call it the good the bad and the ugly outside of the main topics you know, did, was it good was it bad what'd you think and during the vince you know since from when we started the podcast there'd be a lot of good uh bads and uglies on segments that felt like they were wasting your time that felt like they were insulting your intelligence as if you were a little bit and ever since triple h took over there is very few of those like like the floor of what's acceptable on wrestling now is a lot higher there's there, not everything's great. Not everything's good, but nothing feels really bad anymore. So that's been a step forward. There are some issues. I've had a lot of issues with the women's booking since he took over either lack of matches or lack of imagination in the storylines. Bianca Belair continues to just kind of do nothing for the last <laughs> several months. Yeah. You know, like th there is definitely a lot of room for improvement. If, if you wanted me to give a grade, I'd probably say B B plus right now. Like, like it's 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 solid, but there's work to be done still. Yeah, I think that I think that's pretty fair. And and really the we probably won't know uh until we get more towards WrestleMania season about what his really grandiose ideas are, or even after WrestleMania season, because a lot of the things are kind of put into motion uh what when he took over. Um so but going back to college football. If you uh, if you ask journalists, you know, I, I know you have an alma mater that you root for, but you, you, your coverage of college football is, is comes from an unbiased standpoint. And if you ask journalists, they, they just say, oh, you know, I want to see what I want to see happens is basically the story. I root for the story. And so I imagine that when Colorado brought Dion over, you guys were like overjoyed because there's so much content ready to be written about Deion Sanders taking over uh, as head coach at Colorado. We have talked more about Colorado football <laughs> in the college football world over the last week than we have in the previous 10 years. Like that's just what Dion's going to do. And he's going to, the Deion Sanders experience is that he's going to, do a lot of things. He's going to say the quiet part out loud and he's going to do it all on camera. Yes. And that's, that's great for us. You can see his last meeting with the Jackson state team. You can see his first meeting with the Colorado team and that's all entertaining and fun and good. The downside is how is he going to be with media? That's not produced by his son. You know, sure. his son is the one who does the social media for, for a lot of his stuff. He, he was a, he was a before he was a college coach. He was a assistant at a high school here around the Dallas area, coaching his son, who was quarterback. 
a different son who was his quarterback. And I went to one of the games to try to talk to him afterward for a story. And he wouldn't talk to me. He would only talk to a documentary crew that was following him around. And that's basically how it's been ever since. He's got a documentary just kind of going nonstop, <laughs> apparently. So it's it's a mix of it's going to be really entertaining. We're going to have a lot of things to talk about. And it's going to be fun. But it's also going to be how much insight can we get that's not about him that's not yeah. Dion approved that type of thing so like not, from that media standpoint yeah yeah like or how, how many one-on-ones with the local beat writer is he gonna do like I I don't know he didn't Jackson State was he did whatever he wanted so we'll see how it is at Colorado yeah and they have to be ecstatic like because like you said you haven't covered them very much so now all of a sudden they're one of the dandies uh because of you know because of who's who's there so I think th- I thought it was fascinating I was like wow like just the amount of coverage this thing was getting uh and then you know his, his statement talking about the transfer portal and stuff it's just like i can just imagine you guys going like there's so many things that we're going to be able to write about look if i was a former nfl player with all the success he had with all the money he had with all the money he had doing media stuff i wouldn't go back to putting in the grind of being a college football coach like that is a hard job like yeah. you got to really be committed to doing that and so that's why like this isn't like a show like the, he's not doing this you know just to do it like he puts in the work he's a very organized guy he has a plan of what he wants to do and to 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 go to have been through everything he's been through and still want to be a college football coach is a testament to actually you know really wanting to do this and putting in the effort to do this so he deserves credit for that so Andy Bowen says, I think he spends two or three years at Colorado. If he is successful, I see him going to the NFL or a bigger program. But if the program stays bad, I see him moving on. Do you have any thoughts on that? If he has success at Colorado, everybody's going to want to hire him. NFL, college, wherever. I mean, the fact that he's at Colorado right now is because nobody else wanted to hire him yet. The fact that he was at Jackson State before that was the fact that nobody wanted to hire him to be a head coach at that point. He's kind of had to prove himself along the way to get people to believe in what he's doing as a coach. And if if he has Colorado winning 10 games in year two, SEC teams are going to come calling. Big 10 teams are going to come calling. Everybody's going to come calling. The NFL is going to come after that. Where does he ultimately want to go? I don't know. He probably at least wants to see through his son's college career. He's been with him for a few years. He's coming with him to Colorado. So he probably wants to see that out. If it goes badly, I don't know. I I have no idea where things go. He's got a pretty long contract. Um, I don't know. He's probably going to have a pretty long leash. I don't even know what the actual – can't even, I'm trying to just imagine the concept of being like, all right, we got to fire Deion Sanders as our head coach. Like, how's that going to go over? I, I don't yeah, even exactly. know. Um, but if it goes poorly and his son is no longer there with him playing, does he decide to stop doing it? Maybe. I don't know. Uh, I imagine you're saving your prediction for the college national champion uh, for for uh, a future piece or, or so. But uh no, I can tell you. I can tell you. It's Georgia. I'm picking Georgia. Okay. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, that's what I, that's what I was go- going to assume. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but somebody who I've been fascinated by, uh, Jim Harbaugh, because I'm in the Bay Area, got to see him be the head coach at Stanford, then to come over to the 49ers, and then he kind of gets run out of town by the ownership and, and the GM, and he lands at his alma mater, and I think there was you know, there was some expectation that he was going to do the exact same thing at Michigan that he did in San Francisco, which is like immediately turn everything around to become one of the best programs. And uh, they, they've been great, but it seems finally now they're at that stage where uh, you're like, okay, this is, this is what he was expected to do. They're competing for a national championship. Uh, How, how close have you covered Harbaugh and and what do you think about him and, and what he's done? I have not covered him all that closely. I'm not in Michigan. I grew up in Michigan, but I'm not there anymore. I moved down here early into his uh, tenure. Uh, he He's he's a unique guy. And he's a lot like Dion, honestly, in that like sometimes if he just has a 
feeling, if, if he feels strongly about something, he's just going to come out and tell you about it. Yeah. Like he, he came out pretty openly in this recent election cycle about like abortion rights in Michigan. Like <laughs> no, no college coach is going to usually try to touch that stuff. It's just what he does. And so he turned around Michigan very quickly. I, I mean, they almost made the playoff in his second year, I think taking over a program that had really fallen apart. They just couldn't get over Ohio state. They right. couldn't get over that hump. And then the 2020 season happens. I think they go two and four. The Ohio state game gets canceled, canceled because of COVID and that some people wanted him gone. It felt like that might be the end of his tenure that he'd worn out his welcome that he hadn't quite gotten to where he wanted to go. He could win, but he couldn't beat Ohio state and he struggled against Michigan state. He couldn't win the big 10 he completely overhauls his staff. And then last year's team just makes it fine. They finally get over the hump. They beat Ohio state. They go to the playoff. They, they finally get to where people thought he was going to be. They lose some players, some key players. They come back this year and now maybe even better. Now they're undefeated yeah. going into the playoff now. So he's gotten Michigan finally to the place that everybody thought they could be thought they should be. And he did it his way. You know, he, 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 he stuck to he he stuck to what he wanted to do. He made the changes he wanted to make, but he got him there. I mean, and I'm actually surprised he he lasted this long because it seems like he kind of he, he's not the guy to to stay for a long time. He's there to stay for you know a really good time, but maybe not not the longest time. But I, I give him a lot of credit because I'm always rooting for him just because I saw what he did with the 49ers and kind of how he got railroaded out of here. Okay. Well, he, he by the way he he wanted the Vikings job last yeah, year. Like he he absolutely. did a whole day long interview. He tried to take the job. The Vikings ended up not hiring him so uh he said he's committed to staying in michigan you can be sure nfl teams are at least going to see if that's accurate especially the colts we're used to play i don't know what's going to do nobody ever really knows what jim harbaugh is going to do but you're going to hear his name a lot kicked around nfl coaching cycle whether he does something we don't know all right last uh, college football coach and we'll bring it back to your podcast here um I have uh, so this is this yeah this is a little bit of a selfish question here. My San Jose State Spartans, they're in a bowl, the Idaho Potato Bowl. It's one of the first ones. It's like December twentieth. It's like in a couple weeks here against Eastern Michigan. They're favored by at between I don't know three and a half and four and a half points. What well, did, did you? Pro I, I can't imagine you've watched any San Jose State games necessarily, but just give me a little bit of good feeling here are my spartans gonna win this game they've had a very good season i mean i watched them two years ago when they won the mountain west yeah you know, they had that big season out of nowhere to win the conference that was very cool i haven't caught much this year just because there's so many things to kind of catch and they weren't in the, the conference title race but you know they they loaded up on transfers after last season and it, it's really worked for them eastern michigan close to where i grew up uh, a, a similar program that has just kind of been was just so bad for so long, then finally got the right coach to fix things. That's Brent Brennan at San Jose State. That's Chris Creighton at Eastern Michigan. I think these are two of the best coaches, most underrated coaches in college football going into this game. Uh, the fact that where the location is, where San Jose has played before, Eastern Michigan, you know, Midwest teams going out West typically doesn't work out. So I, I, I think I'm probably picking San Jose State to win this one. I like it. I like it. Okay, let's get back to, to getting over. Um, what what do you what do you guys do? What do you and Adam do that you get? You know, there's so many wrestling podcasts out here. Thankfully, I get to do one on uh, on the Wrestling Observer Figure Four site. So you know that, that there's a little bit of of status there. But for you guys, like to just create a podcast to get it out there. I know uh, Adam specifically really cares about those, those five-star reviews and he makes it a focus to get over the hump with that. And that, that's fantastic. Cause that's how, you know, that's how you're, you're uh, messing with the algorithms and such, but like what separates you guys from the other podcast you think? Well, I just think we go pretty in depth talking about every single thing that happens on the show. Our Monday show is the SmackDown raw, you know, recap analysis so we'll talk about the big stories we'll talk about the bloodline we'll go 30 minutes 45 minutes on the biggest stories of what whatever's going on but then we go through every single segment on the show good bad or ugly backstage promo a low card feud whatever hit row is doing you know even if it's like the bottom <laughs> of smackdown like we're going to talk about that and, and share our thoughts on that so I, I think what we take a lot of pride in is 
fully acknowledging and, and, and recognizing everything that goes on on the show, not just the main things that will get talked about on typical wrestling podcasts elsewhere. So it, it's full top to bottom. Again, Adam also does uh, the Thursday show with NXT and AEW. I'm sometimes on there, uh, but we also do instant analysis for pay-per-views. We do big previews for the pay-per-views. We do a Twitter spaces uh, before the pay-per-views go on the air which has been difficult on Saturdays because of college football. So I don't, yeah. li- I do not like <laughs> that AW and WWE doing their shows on Saturdays this uh, fall has just wrecked both of us. Cause he, he, he does college football for CBS. Right. Uh, but yeah, it, it's mostly, it, it's, yeah, I like to think of it as kind of one of the most detailed pro wrestling podcasts around. And the fact that both of us come from journalism backgrounds, from storytelling backgrounds. Uh, I, I, I think that's kind of what makes our, our podcast what it is. Being that you cover the shows so closely, do you have a favorite sort of guilty pleasure storyline or character that you're into right now? Where some people are just like, yeah, I'm not in. Like for me, the worst thing on WWE television for me is Dexter Loomis. I cannot stand what they're doing with him. Like, I'm not the biggest Miz guy. Like, I love Mike Mizanin from MTV and, and the like, I love that guy, but I'm not the biggest Miz fan. But when Dexter Loomis is tied to Johnny Gargano and I'm rooting for the Miz, like, that tells you how, how much I dislike that storyline. But is there anything that, that you kind of get a kick out of that a lot of fans would be like, uh, I don't know about that? This is something Adam and I have clashed on before. I love LA Knight. <laughs> I I th- I think he everything he gets I think he turns it into something good and it, he hasn't done much on the main roster so far but back when he was Eli Drake and TNA and doing those other things just like he talks he talks like Stone Cold Steve Austin but with the rocks <laughs> yes cadence, cadence. It, it, it's like a mixture of the two it's just it, it but he's such a good talker yeah and like I'm somebody who's like I'm somebody who likes the story and who who thinks mic work is more important than wrestling ability so sure. you have to be able to wrestle like it's right. like you can't be doing nothing out there but like i'd be much i'm much more into like a great promo than i am a great match on dynamite or something like that that's just me personally how, yeah. how i am with it so so la Knight, he did you know the model stuff it was ridiculous but like <laughs> he made it work the, the 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 maximum male models max dupree like it worked it was funny it was low card it was nothing but like it felt like it was worth my time to watch and so he gets into this feud with bray wyatt and the face-off that they did was one of the most entertaining things outside of the bloodline that I think WWE had done. And we haven't really gone back to that. It's just been a lot of Bray promos, a lot yeah. of something happened backstage. I want to get those two back in the ring together because two completely different personalities, two different talkers. But I'm an LA Knight guy. Adam was Adam hated him in NXT until he turned face with like the 2.0 versus black and gold bit. And he's kind of come around since. But uh, I've... Guilty pleasures in wrestling. I've, I've been an L.A. night guy. There you go. And he's going to have uh, his work cut out for him because when they do eventually get to that Bray Wyatt match, uh, I, I think there's going to be some, some bloom off the rose there for Bray, for Bray Wyatt, and I just hope that he doesn't get the blame for, for that. So, uh, yeah, good luck to both of them on that. Okay, so uh, getting over podcasts, you can find these guys uh, everywhere. Uh, Adam and Chris, uh, you see the... Uh, those watching on video, you can see the at getting overcast is the the Twitter handle for the podcast. Anything else you you want to plug before we get out of here? Uh, yeah, just at getting overcast on Twitter. Everything's there. Adam does a lot of live tweeting of the shows on there, and also uh, if you're a fan of pretty much any sports team, hope you check out the Athletic. Uh, we've always got sales going on to to buy sub- subscription and um, NFL season, NBA, NHL, college football. Like, hope you check out the Athletic. Everybody who knows me knows that I was a day one athletic uh, subscriber when uh, you guys finally rolled out to the Bay Area. So I've been on ever since uh, the news feed with who you can follow and the teams and the authors so that you don't miss. Like I, I follow Chris on there so I could see what the latest that, that he's written, like on uh, Jeff Brom, who former 49er quarterback. I saw that piece today. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, the athletic is great. Everybody who knows me knows that I, I, I live by the athletic. So thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks for hanging out with 